Hello, and welcome to Talking to Thinkers with me, Johnny Lyons. In this episode, I should be talking to a politician. My guest is John Alderdice, former leader of the Alliance Party in Northern Ireland, a key player in the Good Friday Agreement, and now a Lord in the House of Lords in Westminster. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hello, and welcome to Talking to Thinkers, John. Well, thank you very much, Johnny. It's uh, lovely to to join you again and uh, have a good extended conversation. Great. Well, the way I normally begin our sort of conversations, John, is I ask my guest to talk about his early years, um, how he or she became what they became. Uh, so if we start maybe with uh, you give us an account of your early days growing up in Northern Ireland. I was uh, born uh, as a son of the manse, as uh, it would be described in Presbyterian circles. In other words, my father was a Presbyterian minister and uh, we lived in a manse. In the early days, just across the road from the church, it was a, a country church, Donna Cloney, Presbyterian church, Donna Cloney, a little linen village in rural Northern Ireland. And uh, my father had uh, qualified. Uh, first of all, he, he did a degree uh, in Northern Ireland uh, at McGee University College, uh, spent a little bit of time because it was linked with uh, Trinity College in Dublin, spent a little bit of time there, and then went on to do um, a postgraduate degree, a divinity degree at New College in Edinburgh. That wasn't an unusual thing for a Presbyterian in Northern Ireland to do, because of course Presbyterianism in, in Ireland it came from Scottish Presbyterianism. And so it, it wasn't that unusual for someone to go and do a degree there. But I think he also found it interesting because there was a, a great range of people studying in Edinburgh, much more than would have been the case uh, in, uh, at McGee College or, or even uh, at an Irish university. Um, so he enjoyed that. Um, uh, my mother and he actually met before he went to Edinburgh. And uh, so she would fly over from time to time to meet up with him. She was a, a, a Belfast girl came from a Baptist background, uh, which was probably um, more conservative uh, even than the background that my father came from. Uh, but they were both very much in love uh, for the whole of their lives. They, they, once they got married, they hardly spent uh, any time apart at all, right through to the end of their lives. Um, and, and very devoted to each other and to the family and to uh, my father's work. Uh, their social life was largely connected with, with the, the church and people that they knew there. And uh, my mother didn't have any um, separate job other than in the family and in the church. She looked after a lot of um, women's organizations within the church and so on. Um, and so I grew up uh, as, as part of a man's family. And in that sense, it was kind of like a, a team um, uh, being part of the, the ministry uh, that my father was conducting in the church. You, you, you felt that you were part of that, which had lots of very good bits and, and also uncomfortable bits to it. Um, um, but uh, I, I count myself extremely fortunate in the family that I grew up in because it was a very loving and caring family, not just within the family itself, but um, there was a great sense of care for the community for which my father was responsible and to which he was ministering. And that was a very good atmosphere in which to grow up. I'm not one that was dismissive of, of different ideas. On the contrary, uh, I had the good fortune that when I would listen to the, the minister preaching the sermon, I would be able to argue with him about it over the lunch table and tell him where I, I thought he got it wrong. And, uh, and he would argue back. And it was a very good training for, for politics. My poor mum just wanted us to have a quiet family <laughs> Sunday lunch. Um, but you know, this, this was the way it was, and we would toss these things backwards and forwards. Um, but, but again, from my point of view, tremendously to, to my benefit, and all in a very loving context. So, growing up in that, in that kind of uh, context, uh, John, um, things that strike me there is very, very much part of the community. Um, and the, my second question is, did, did you have very strong religious views then as a result of being the son of a Presbyterian minister? First of all, part of the community, yes, but of course it was Northern Ireland and therefore it was part largely of a Protestant community. Uh, my father had come from, from South Armagh, uh, from Mulla Glass, which is a little uh, hamlet really uh, between Bestbrook and Newry, um, and so near to the border. 
and uh, and there was an awareness that yes we were part of a protestant community but there was a there was a larger community and there was a catholic community and there was the community on the other side of the border which was not in itself a, a problem in those days when i was growing up a day out was very often a day uh, to somewhere in, south of the border um uh, across carlingford lock and in a in a boat or or, or driving right over to to the west to Buncrana. um it it wasn't seen as a as, a, as an unpleasant, foreign, distant place, as it was for other Protestants, less at that time than subsequently. Um, but, but the community that I grew up in was, was very much a Protestant community. And yes, the, the religious, the faith dimension was very important. Um, but again, in a, in a searching kind of way. So when we would go off on holidays, for example, and, and my father and mother liked to, to take us, uh, we would go off on camping holidays in Ireland in the first place, then in the rest of the British Isles. Uh, and subsequently, we had a lot of holidays where we would drive, you know, drive to, to the south of Spain and back, drive to, drive to Athens and back, to Vienna and back, to Helsinki and back, and visit all of these countries. And when we would do that, uh, yes, there would be a great interest in, in, in visiting some religious community, and, and often that meant a, a Catholic church or an Orthodox church or, or, or some other religious group. It would be interesting to go and understand and experience something of their approach to faith and life. But yes, faith has always been an important uh, driver for me and, and remains so. So it, it sounds that um, religious but not dogmatic, um, is, is, that, is that something that associated with Presbyterianism or is that just something that the way, the way of your parents? Within Presbyterianism there have always been at least two significant strands. There's one which is, is, is really quite conservative um, and, and dogmatic and has actually in recent years become increasingly fundamentalist. It, it wasn't particularly before, it was conservative and there are different strands within that conservatism. There were those who were very evangelical and influenced a great deal by American evangelicalism, particularly during the 20th century. Uh, prior to that, influenced much more by uh, Scottish conservatism. But there's also always been uh, an important liberal strand uh, that, that saw themselves as, as searchers who were uh, not dogmatic about the relationship with God, uh, and indeed, on the contrary, always of the view that that God was so transcendent that any journey to engage with the transcendent was, was something that was always going to be uh, a continuing one. And in some senses, perhaps, uh, that strand also saw itself um, very much with its Jewish background, uh, the, the notion of pilgrimage, the journey, the, the, the people of God always on the journey to somewhere, somewhere else, somewhere that goes beyond. And of course, you had those strands within Judaism too, the conservative and the reform, uh, the, the, the liberal and, and the more fundamentalist. Uh, so it was, it, it was that strand really uh, that I identified most with. I think my father always found himself a little bit moving between the two strands. He, he, he was often uncomfortable about how far liberals might go. Um, I remember not him, but actually one of my uh, consultant colleagues in psychiatry, uh, I we were talking and, and I was asking some questions and he said to me, uh, Dr. Alderdice, he was always very courteous and polite, Dr. Alderdice, that's the kind of place I can't go to. That's the kind of question I can't allow myself to answer. And I know my father would never have said that. I think there was a sense that there were certain questions he was very cautious about. Um, and that was, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable thing. Um, but I, I find myself, perhaps typically as an adolescent, um, pushing a little bit against that and seeing, well, how far would the door open and, 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 and what could you allow yourself to think? And of course, uh, as time went on and I became more involved in the dilemmas in Northern Ireland and, and working with people in psychiatry who were themselves suffering from a lot of disturbance and trying to understand and think about that, I find my own thinking going, I think, beyond where my father would have been comfortable in going. Uh, though even in his later years, he, he was still asking questions and struggling with things and, and not necessarily coming to an answer. And he would sometimes in his, in his sermons, for example, he would put a question to people um, without necessarily giving an answer. Um, but he did it in a way that didn't alienate himself from a, a really very conservative, in some cases quite politically conservative and even religiously fundamentalist congregation. Hmm. 
and, uh, and as you've indicated there about psychiatry, you obviously decided um, when you did your, well, you are leaving Surrey, you left school, you decided to follow medicine rather than the church. Um, so uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, your, your university years, how it changed you? Um, obviously, it drove you in the way of medicine and psychiatry, but more generally, what sort of effect it had on your outlook? Well, uh, you're quite right. There was a, a choice that needed to be made because there was a certain expectation, not so much from my parents, perhaps more from people in the congregation. I'd been very involved. I'd very often spoken at young people's events and, and so on. And I think a lot of people would have looked at me and said, well, you know, he's going to follow his father into the church. But, but in fact, one of the things that, that stopped me doing that was that I used to read a great deal. And my father uh, had, had, had quite a study full of books, though I think he spent less and less time in it as the years would go on. But I would go in and I would search around and I would, I would read stuff. And, and my mother would go up and find that I'd fallen asleep reading the Westminster Confession of Faith or the, or the, the Book of Common Order or something of that kind. But much more interestingly, in many ways, there were the old Kirk Session minutes and so you would, you would understand how things were dealt with. And, and there were many stories I could tell you about those minutes. But one was particularly, I think, influential on me. And that was the minister went up to the General Assembly, the annual meeting of the, of the, the church. And he voted on some issue. I can't remember what it was. And he came back and the session didn't like what he'd done. And so they voted to, to dock his salary by 50% for the next 12 months until he would go back and vote in the right way. Now, that gave me really quite serious questions about how far if I did go into the ministry I would really be free enough to follow where the spirit would take me and how much I would be held to uh, to account by a congregation particularly by, by a Kirk session I think that influenced me quite a lot I mean ironically I ended up going into psychiatry where where you know it was half of it was pastoral in the sense of of, of psychotherapy uh, and then, of course, I went into the politics, where you're very much <laughs> seeking the approval of, of the voters on a regular basis. But, you know, nevertheless, uh, I think at that stage, I, I, was, I was thinking, no, I don't want to go into the church. Well, what would be useful? I, I thought about going to the mission field. I thought if I went to the mission field, then, then medicine would be very useful, it would be a way of caring and looking after people. But it would also be intellectually stimulating. And so I went into medicine, and, and I enjoyed that, though I did lots of other things during my time at university. And then, of course, as you come to the later part of that time, you begin to think, well, what specialty? Do you want to go into general practice or some kind of area of specialist uh, medicine? And I was very impressed by a consultant psychiatrist I, I spent some time with. Um, his insight into people, his understanding of what was going on. And at that time, I was struggling very much with the question, why do um, people behave in such self-destructive ways? I was living in a community that was breaking down into violence, and the question was why? Nobody was benefiting from it. So the notion that this was all rational um, behavior, rational actors operating in their best social, economic and power interests didn't make any kind of sense to me, although that was the political science explanation of things at that time. And it seemed to me that, that people behaved in, in very non-rational ways and often very self-damaging ways. And, and, and this particular psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Artie Kerr, who was a very distinguished psychiatrist in Northern Ireland, and uh, I was impressed by him and I thought, well, you know, that would be a good direction to go. And, and I was also influenced by the fact that the other area that I was interested in was what we would call public health medicine. Uh, has a very high profile with the, with the pandemic, of course. Um, but I thought, well, that would be an interesting thing to go into. And then I realized, of course, that if you go into that, you're effectively a civil servant. So getting directly involved in politics then would simply not be possible. And so uh, as my enthusiasm for psychiatry, particularly psychological psychiatry, psychoanalytic psychiatry developed, um, and my interest in politics, which had been there you know, all the way through my teens, um, I, I went more and more in that direction. I, I wasn't that interested in, in surgery. General medicine was okay. Uh, general practice, I, I wasn't really sure I wanted to do. And, uh, and public health medicine, as I say, had this problem that it would have kept me out of politics and I was becoming increasingly interested in and concerned about the politics as, as the situation in Northern Ireland deteriorated. Yeah, so, I mean, if we could just uh, maybe talk about that. that. So, when you were in university, um, can you talk a little bit about what was going on in Northern Ireland society and politics that was kind of really registering your, your attention and... Uh, thinking, oh, this is not 
the way it should be. Yes, well, I, I, I was going up to, uh, to Queen's University to study medicine in the early 1970s, when, where things were really getting pretty bad. Um, they, were, they were not good in almost any part of Northern Ireland, even in, in relatively rural Ballymena. Um, the, the protests of, of, of the UDA and the Loyalist paramilitaries uh, were really quite, quite a problem in the early 1970s. Uh, good, decent people being confronted by these fellows and not able to get to their work. And I remember one member of the congregation who owned a, a, a garage, with, uh, sold cars and so on, and he wasn't happy to go along with what they were demanding. And they simply lifted him up and threw him through the plate glass windows of, of his garage. You know, it was quite a frightening kind of time. Of course, when you're that age, even though it's frightening, it's, it's also kind of a little bit exciting as well that all of these things are going on and this is, this is not just ordinary life, this is really something very substantial and significant. So there's this mixture of anxiety and excitement going on. And then I, I, I went up to Queen's, which was 1973. Um, the, the situation was deteriorating further. I, I remember uh, uh, as I was going into the car park on, on one of the evenings, this hail of stones ar arrived uh, uh, around my, my head. And the reason was that where we lived as medical students was, was at the Royal Victoria Hospital, just right on the borderline between Loyalist West Belfast and, and Nationalist and Republican West Belfast. And there were these great fences uh, around the, where, we, where we lived. Indeed, I, was, I remember being out uh, uh, doing some revising for my exams. And again, you know, stones started arriving around your head and you had to head in and um, and do your revision inside so it was it, it was an unusual circumstance uh, having said that it's remarkable how you get used to these sorts of situations and and treat them as normal and not long after that i i i was going backwards and forwards to england because i was getting involved in various activities there and i remember going going into a, a, a shop uh, the big sort of department store type shop in, in London. And as soon as I walked in through the doors, I just stood and, and spread eagle like this here because you were used when you went into a shop in Belfast to being searched. These people were just looking at me and thinking, what, what kind of a guy is this? What on earth's wrong with him? And of course, this was just the normality of Belfast was absolutely nor not the normality of, of, of London. Uh, but that was just a measure of how you, you, you know, you kind of got used to a way of going. Um, people are, as individuals and communities, really quite resilient and you find ways of, of managing. That's not to say it doesn't have an impact on you, um, but you, know, you find a way of surviving even through some very strange and, and often disturbing times. Mm. But interestingly, in your case, you know, uh, most people um, are observers of politics. Um, I mean, you could have just focused on your psychiatry and observed what was going on in Northern Ireland. You both decided to become a participant um, so, um, and a very and, a, and an increasingly important one as your career developed. So, can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to become go from an observer to a participant and how you how you participated? Yes, it's it, it, it's quite interesting in a way because you know here I was I was this you know, son of the manse, be very sensible, rational, thoughtful, and so on. And yet, very interested in politics with all its uh, vicissitudes. Um, and so I had kind of mapped out for myself uh, a, a direction. In those days, uh, it's not the case now, but in those days, uh, because of the psychological pressures that people uh, felt were present in psychiatry, uh, the, the National Health Service allowed you to retire at the age of 55 um, if you had worked in mental health um, all through your career uh, without a reduction in, in your pension. And uh, so I had mapped out in my mind that the sensible thing to do, because nobody was going to pay for me to be in my kind of politics, if I was a nationalist or if I was a unionist, I could get elected as an MP and so on. But in, in the kind of politics I was interested in, I, I, I reckon that would always be difficult. So I had this mapped out in my very sensible um, late adolescent mind that what I would do is I would I'd go into medicine. And I would do my medical uh, studies and then work as a doctor through uh, in psychiatry until I was 55. And then I would retire and I would still be young enough to get involved in politics uh, because I was always somebody who liked to be engaged in doing stuff. I, I, even now, I still get frustrated with, with my colleagues in the House of Lords who talk about foreign policy and what's happening in various countries that they've never been to. 
And I kind of think, how do, you, how, do you know, how do you know anything about that? You read a few books and papers, but that's not the same thing as being in a place. You, you can understand a place better for being there for two days than you can for reading about it for six months. So I, I've always been that kind of person about getting engaged with, with things. But there was this other sort of sensible part, if you like, that said, no, don't get involved. Anyway, I, I, I did my initial medical training and then in psychiatry, but with an interest in the psychoanalytic aspect of psychiatry and understanding why people behaved in these self-destructive ways. And I have the thought that if, if I could understand this for individuals, maybe I could understand why my community was behaving in this very self-destructive way. And so that involved me going into analysis. And I was very fortunate because um, a rather senior and experienced analyst who'd, who'd worked uh, with, uh, with Anna Freud and her colleagues for most of his professional life. In fact, she had written the foreword to a number of the books that he had, had written. He came back to Northern Ireland. Um, he had a son who was learning disability and there was a very good service available in the area he came back to. And uh, so I was very fortunate. I was able to go into five times a week classical Freudian psychoanalysis with somebody who you know, had, had, had known Anna Freud and worked with her and so on. So it was really incredibly fortunate. And, uh, and I went into uh, analysis as, as, a, as a part of my training. And as time went on, I, I began to think a lot about this question of, 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 of the commitment and interest in, in politics and in if you like, political psychology or what was at the back of politics from a psychological point of view. And I came to the conclusion, I, I can remember it quite well in the analysis, I came to the conclusion that this terribly sensible part of me that was saying, well, you know, you work and earn a living up to 55 and then you go into politics was really just a defense against the anxiety of what would happen if I went into politics and, and, and failed and it was a disaster and I couldn't make a living and all of this kind of business. Because by this stage, Joan and I had got married when we were both medical students. And uh, so I, I began to realize, no, you actually just, you're scared of the implications of going into politics. It's a rough and tumble. It is in the case of Ireland, uh, potentially violent in the North. Uh, you, you, you may make a, a complete mess of yourself if you do that. But is that what you really want to do? Well, if that's what you really want to do, get on with it. And, and I can remember very well the point of my analysis when I, when I realized, no, that's, that's what this is about. This, this, this training analysis is not just to understand, it's also about you working up to understanding what you need to do to take your courage in your hand and go ahead and do what you believe in. And so that's what happened. And uh, I, I, I came to a close in the analysis and, and continued that work. And, and that continued to provide me with an income, but increasingly on a part-time basis to enable me to be free to do the politics and to get involved in it. Okay, uh, very interesting. And um, it is amazing if psychoanalysis can lead. Yes. Um, the, um, you decided, so you decided to join the Alliance Party. Uh, which was the kind of non-sectarian side of probably what you might call unionism. Um, what led you to choose the Alliance Party as opposed to the other parties that were available back then? Well, I actually wrote to what were called the four constitutional parties, main constitutional parties uh, in those days. Sinn Féin was still very much uh, involved in the, in the, in the IRA's violence and so on. Uh, so I wrote to uh, the SDLP, uh, the Ulster Unionist Party, the Democratic Unionist Party and the Alliance Party, and I got back the material from them. And the two unionist parties, I mean, literally their leaflets were printed in red, white and blue. I mean, looking back, it was completely extraordinary, but that's the way it was. And there was very little about any kind of policy and a few statements about the union and stuff like that, but uh, not much intellectual substance there. The SDLP, uh, thoughtful material, a uh, bit left of centre, which suited me fine, but it was absolutely clearly a nationalist party and, uh, and committed to bringing that outcome. The Alliance Party the, the line was basically a, a liberal democratic one that said, well, we believe that the people of Northern Ireland uh, it, 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 at the current time want to remain as part of the United Kingdom, therefore they should be able to do so. But a very substantial minority want to be part of the United Ireland, so they're going to have to be very close relations with the Republic of Ireland. And the future should be a matter of consent, not threat or violence of any description, but the people should be able to make their own decision. If they want to be part of the United Ireland, that's fine. If they want to stay in the UK, that's fine. But whichever happens, and whichever side is the minority, their interests also have to be taken into account in various uh, constitutional and institutional ways. And I felt 
well, first of all, that, that's, that's what I believe. Um, and, and secondly, it seems to me that's a potentially therapeutic platform. That's, that's a place where I can engage with people in the union side of the, of the community, on the national side of the community. Uh, and the main interest for me is therefore not the constitutional question of whether you remain in the United Kingdom or in the United Ireland, or increasingly for me, being part of a United Europe was a more important uh, element to things. Um, but but I, I, I won't be then functioning in, in, for me, a partisan way. Some people may look at me and think I'm partisan in one way or another, but that's not the point. Uh, I can get engaged in the lines. And so I did. And, and a chap from the Alliance Party came round. And uh, gradually I got uh, increasingly involved with political parties. If you're enthusiastic, they're voluntary organizations and there's always loads of things for people to do. And so I got involved. I got involved in the policy side. I got involved in the local association. I, the very first time I stood for election was in the middle of the hunger strike. And I remember it was a fairly Protestant area and things were very polarized. And I remember going down to one village, it was a fairly rural area, going down to one village and, and I came to the first door and I knocked the door and I gave my leaflet and explained I was standing. And the man just looked at me and said, don't waste your time, son, there's no votes for you here. <laughs> and he was probably right. Um, but uh, I, I got involved and, and became increasingly enthusiastic, not because things were going in a very good way, but for the contrary reason, that, that things were becoming worse and therefore it was more important to get involved and do whatever you could. And at the same time, to deepen your understanding of things. I remember my old psychoanalytic teacher, Tom Freeman saying, you know, you'll actually learn a lot more from working with more disturbed people who are very difficult to get better than you will working with less disturbed people who may well get better more easily. And then you don't even know whether you actually had any impact on that at all or not. So don't be worried about engaging with very disturbed people who are hard to get better. And of course, that was, that was Northern Ireland. It was, a, it was a very intractable problem. And mm -hmm. so getting involved in that uh, was not an alien thing for me in that sense. I suppose it's a rather perverse approach to things. But, but it was true for psychiatry, and I think it's true for political conflict resolution. Mm. During those years, then, when you joined the Alliance, before we come to you taking over uh, as leader of the Alliance Party, uh, for people that may not be familiar with the, what was going on in Northern Ireland at the time, can you give us a sense of, you mentioned there things were getting worse. So can you give a picture of how bad things were in the, as the 70s and 80s progressed in Northern Ireland? First of all, on the ground, things were becoming uh, very violent. I and mean, they had been extremely violent in the early 1970s and, and almost broke down into complete open and frank civil war. Uh, British army came in um, and for a period of time, I think people would have felt that we're containing things. Now, after a period of time, uh, I think quite a number of people, particularly in the Nationalist and Republican side, began to see them very much as part of the problem rather than as containing things. But there were various ways in which the British government and indeed the Irish government tried to contain things and keep them from just uh, becoming complete catastrophe. For example, even during the times of Margaret Thatcher, whenever she was becoming very austere on, on public expenditure in the rest of the UK, that was not the case in Northern Ireland. Huge amounts of money within not just to security, but to economic development and community development and so on, because there was a view, a mistaken one in many ways, but a view that if you put enough money into the situation, you could deal with the economic element of the problem, and that would basically sort things out and settle things down, which, is, which was not true. But, but it, it did contain things to some extent, and so people could still you know, get education, go to hospital if they were sick, go to the doctor if it, if it wasn't uh, so severe, um, get on with general life, companies would have a difficult time, but there was some assistance to them to, to help them to survive. But it was very difficult indeed. I mean, pretty nearly every day, there would be some kind of atrocity. A bomb would go off. Somebody would have been shot. They might have been killed or they might have been disabled. Or, uh, and then from time to time, really horrible things would happen. But a bomb would go off in a restaurant and people's legs would be blown off and other people would be killed and people left with horrible injuries and so on. And there would be violence from both sides. The, the, the violence from the loyalists tended to be a bit different. It tended to be shootings and things of that kind. They weren't really um, so much into and so much skilled at things like bombings, as was the case on, on the Republican side, particularly with the provisional IRA. But the violence was, was bad. 
for the first period of time during the 1970s, there was still a considerable sense of hope. Um, the, the peace people, initially the peace women, and then the peace people in the, in the 1970s, uh, and indeed Alliance itself, uh, continued to provide a degree of hope right through uh, the 1970s. And then we came to 1979. And, and I think that really was, was the watershed, because up until then, for example, the Alliance Party had, had more votes than the Democratic Unionist Party. But in 1979, first of all, uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, became Prime Minister. Um, and, and secondly, uh, the Alliance Party found its, its, its position being reversed. Ian Paisley was elected as, the, uh, as one of the three MEPs for Northern Ireland. Uh, that's given a, a tremendous platform uh, on which to build politically. Uh, whereas Alliance, in fact, which had great hopes of winning uh, the East Belfast constituency, just missed it. But when you just miss something politically, uh, you very often find that you then slide back. And the general sense of optimism amongst people deteriorated. And of course, Margaret Thatcher and her approach uh, was not one that won over those who disagreed with her, whether that was the miners in, in, in England or whether it was Republicans in Ireland. She was a very polarizing figure. And that was reflected in the politics that continued on, not just because of her, but, but the dynamic went the other way. And then, of course, in the early 1980s, you had the hunger strike, uh, and that meant um, street protests and violence of all, of all sorts. Uh, by the, the mid, early to mid 1980s, uh, the British and Irish governments were beginning to feel again concerned, as they had been in the early to mid 1970s, that things could just break down into complete chaos and civil war. And that's when uh, the two governments came together and produced the Anglo-Irish Agreement uh, with the idea of containing it and to some extent of bolstering up John Hume's nationalist SDLP against the increasing rise of Sinn Féin um, after the hunger strike. So it was not a good time uh, and it was, it was not a good time for Alliance, but much more importantly, it was a very bad time for, for people in Northern Ireland. Mm. In that sort of, sort of bleak situation, if you're not a pessimist, people just find you as naive. How does, what's the psychological situation there? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, I remember the, the editorial in the Belfast Telegraph, which was the main evening newspaper in Northern Ireland in those days, and, and a relatively moderate newspaper at that time. And, and uh, when I was elected to the leadership of the Alliance Party, the editor was basically, well, he's a nice guy, but, you know, it's a hopeless situation altogether. So you're quite right. Uh, people um, felt, well, this is, uh, this is not, it's not possible to sort this problem out at all. I think one of the, maybe one of the reasons I was elected, I don't know, but, but certainly one of the opportunities that I found was, uh, I was quite young. Uh, I was 32 when I was elected. I was a psychiatrist. What a strange kind of notion. Um, what's this guy like? I wonder what's, what, what, what's he about? It's, it's not coming from a traditional sort of perspective. And so when I asked for meetings with, uh, with the British Prime Minister, with the Irish Taoiseach, with leaders of other political parties, initially they were quite interested to have the meetings. I think curiosity, <laughs> because it was something a bit different in Northern Ireland. You've got responsibility for Northern Ireland and it's, everything is just more of the same, more unionism, but more extreme, more nationalism, but, but moving to republicanism. And then this guy appears and, you know, well, that's a bit different. We'll, we'll, we'll have a chat with this guy and see, see what he's up to. Might be just a bit interesting. And it, it gave me the opportunity to engage with, uh, with leading figures and to explore with them a different way of thinking about politics, not one that was uh, overly optimistic, uh, one that seems very difficult, very challenging problems. But the first thing that we've got to do is try to find a way of engaging in conversation with each other. I'd never be able to treat a patient if the patient doesn't come along or, or if I'm not prepared to listen to the patient. So, uh, and I suppose talking in this kind of way and beginning even at that stage, to introduce a, a systemic way of thinking to, to politics, because in, in my own work in psychiatry, I've become familiar in family therapy with the fact you couldn't, you couldn't resolve the problems of a young girl with an eating disorder if you didn't understand the family context that she was working in. Therefore, it wasn't just about Protestants and Catholics, Unionists and Nationalists in Northern Ireland. There was also the other relationship between North and South, and there was the relationship between East and West, between Britain and Ireland disturbed historic relationships. So 
a slightly different kind of way of thinking about things, and, and in some senses, a way of thinking that was not entirely alien to the thinking that John Hume was also beginning to develop, uh, of course, from a, a much more nationalist perspective. But, but there was something interesting going on there. And I, I think that began to make it possible. I, I, you know, I did all sorts of things to just try to, uh, to, to, to make a bit of a, a difference to things in a more strategic way, not, not barging at people or having rows with them or whatever, but, but trying to find strategic or tactical ways of, of engaging. So that, for example, when I, when I became the leader of the Alliance Party, the party was in terrible mess. I mean, the, the, the politically, wasn't really going anywhere terribly much. Financially, it was in great difficulties. The vote was going down. Uh, and I remember Oliver Napier, one of my predecessors, saying that, you know, as Alliance leader, he felt he was a slum landlord because the Alliance Party headquarters was such a mess. And yet you were insisting on the sort of two or three members of staff that you have working in this place where there was a hole in the floor and paper peeling off the walls and stuff like that. And I thought, well, what can I do? We don't have any money. So so I, I, I bought a couple of tins of paint and said to my wife, can you rig up some curtains and we'll get an old piece of carpet for that we don't need for, the, for the, the house we've moved into. And we'll just physically ourselves start to tidy this up. Well, what happened was that other members of the party then began to feel guilty that this, this, this young leader, this young doctor who was, who was the leader was spending his time you know, painting the party headquarters. Let's go in and give him a hand. Now, if I'd said to people, we have to do this, they would say, well, you know, what, what, why, why do you think we have to do it? We're not, you know, we're not a, a, an interior design company. We're a, we're a political party. But when I went in and did it, and they began to feel a little bit guilty and, and want to be cooperative and helpful, they come in with me, and that started to smarten things up. Um, I would write letters and I began very quickly to discover that writing letters to, to people in the party, you needed to physically sign every single one of those letters if you wanted people to respond with some money. And it might be five pounds or ten pounds, so that was absolutely great. And I would sign off thousands of letters going out to party members and supporters and so on. I would try to develop a different approach to things. For example, the party leadership when they were making political statements, they would always say, well, on the one hand, the unionists are at fault for this reason, and the other hand, the nationalists were at fault for this reason. And I, I realized that there was no point in saying that because you were then completely predictable. Why report the Alliance Party whenever you knew what they were going to do was criticize both sides? So what I would try to do, um, psychologically, but also politically, was try to identify where is the obstruction of the moment? Where is the problem at this particular point? Is it because unionists are doing something or not doing something or nationalists are doing something or not doing something? And I would then make a point about that. And at the start, some of my colleagues were, were anxious about that because they thought, oh, you know, if you criticize the unions, we're going to be regarded as too green. If you criticize the nationalists, we're going to be regarded as too orange. I said, don't worry about it. The other side will very soon give us an opportunity to, to pick up on what they're doing. But for the moment, we've, we, we've got to focus on this because this is the issue of the moment. And what then happened was the journalists and commentators began to say, well, this is interesting. I, I wonder who he's going to see as the problem now. And so I began to, to pick up the interest of journalists, radio, television, print journalists, who would say, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because this is where he thinks the problem is at the moment. Not, oh, well, you know, the Alliance Party just said the same thing again. But, but well, this is kind of interesting. Why is he saying that? It's worth interviewing him to try to find out why he's identifying that as the problem. And it's not always one side that he's criticizing or engaging with. And he is prepared to meet people. And he is having these meetings. And he is going to other people's places. You know, I, after I met with, with, with John Hume, um, Bernie McIver, who looked after his foil constituency for him, she was the chairman of the constituency, she wrote to him and said, uh, you know, would you, would you come and speak in, in, at uh, John's uh, SDLP constituency association? I said, absolutely, on the condition that he comes and speaks to East Belfast Alliance as well, which he did. Um, so just trying different, a different kind of approach to politics, very much influenced by the experience I had in various aspects of the psychological approach to psychiatry. It's very interesting. You're saying so many things there that are, are quite fascinating. I mean, first of all, about political leadership. There's, you know, there's no, you don't go to university and find out how to become a political leader. Um, and yet you're saying things there that uh, were critical to your success as a political leader. You know, symbolism, um, being unpredictable, yep. in the mold, uh, having the courage of your convictions, bringing people along. You know, there's a lot of things going on there that are interesting and a lot of the time are never discussed. Um, so can you talk a little bit 
and then of course your background in psychiatry seems to have been really really important here um and you know going back to my original question about the difference between you know pessimism and naivety maybe that's a fa- that was a false although very common dichotomy uh, there's a kind of an intelligent hopefulness to what you do and it, and it goes underlying psychiatry as well you've got to think you can help this person your patients so that seems to be kind of motivating and informing your approach so can you say a little bit more about your challenges and uh, and being a political leader you, you took over this party quite young how did that feel well it felt it felt a bit intimidating because in the first instance when i threw my hat in the ring i didn't expect to to win the leadership and what i expected was that um, the, the other main candidate was a chap called Seamus Close. He was very experienced. He'd been an assembly member. He'd been chairman of the party. He was very well known. He was very articulate, and very uh, bright. And um, I fully expected that Seamus would win. But I reckoned that if I threw my hat in the ring uh, and I did kind of reasonably well, and we had a reasonably civilized uh, competition between the two of us, he would probably win. He certainly had the support of all the senior leadership of the party, but he would probably feel he was a as you would recognize by his name, he was from the Catholic side of the party, though not a, uh, not particularly nationalist at all, very strong, quite conservative, but very anti-violence. Uh, and I thought, yeah, Seamus will probably offer me the deputy leadership because the deputy leadership of the party in alliance was not elected by the party. It was appointed by the leader at, at, at that time. He'll probably offer me the deputy leadership. That will be great. It'll give me a platform. It'll give me an opportunity to do things. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm still not a consultant. I'm still a, a junior doctor. And, and so that would be quite convenient. It would be the best of both worlds. Well, that was fine, but I knew that I still had to do a bit of campaigning. And I got together a, a group of the young Turks in the party, about half a dozen uh, in the front room of, of, uh, of our home. And we had a bit of a chat about you know, running a little bit of a campaign and decided, well, you go to those constituencies and you go to those constituencies and you just get a sense. What's, what's the level of support? Well, as they started coming back in the weeks running up to the, the actual uh, date of the election, um, they started saying to me, actually, you've got, you've got majority support. What we're picking up is a 60-40 split, 60% for you and 40% for Seamus. Um, and I thought, well, you know, maybe they're just a bit optimistic, as, as, as Alliance canvassers often are, maybe need to be. Um, but, you know, OK, maybe there's a possibility. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. When, when we went to the party council, a special council, we gave our speeches, we had our questions asked, then there was the vote, and the vote was 60-40 for me. And so suddenly I find myself uh, launched into this. And uh, I remember very well, the, the, that, that was on the Saturday, I went down on the Sunday to talk to John Kushnahan, who was my predecessor as, as leader, uh, to get a bit of advice from him. And, and some bits of advice he gave me were absolutely spot on. I remember him saying, John, if you ever want to know what the heart of the Alliance Party is, is feeling, then go talk to Adi Morrow. Adi had, had been a, a deputy leader of the party. He came from a, a party that had been liberals, liberal farmers in, in, in North Down for, for hundreds of years. I mean, literally they made it for a long time. And always at the heart of liberalism. Um, one of his brothers was the leader of the Corrymeela community, you know, this kind of thing. He, he'll tell you what the heart of the party is. He's completely right about that. What he was not right about was he said, the next few months will be re- relatively peaceful and it'll enable you to just get settled in and do things and so on and so on. Well, the next few few months were not at all peaceful. We had Inneskillen, we had the Gibraltar 3, we had a whole bunch of stuff happened that was anything but peaceful. Um, and so I found myself launched in, in, in a way which was, was, was intimidating and anxiety provoking, but it also meant that I had the opportunity of, of getting my face and my name and my voice known to people because there was a, a demand for some kind of response to all of these kinds of things. And, uh, and I, I was able to provide a, an alternative perspective on some of these things, which I think helped to get me known at the time, which of course is very important. Uh, visibility is very important in, in political life. Hmm. It sounds to me like you're, you're fairly quick thinking on your feet. Is that, is that, am I right about that? And is that a key skill here? You know, you were launched into this you just got to get on with it now. And you didn't have this, you had a rude awakening as opposed to a gradual buildup. Um, did you find this kind of destabilizing or did you ever fall into a kind of a situation where you were almost a mental cramp or 
you know, you, you're almost stilled by the enormity of your of your job. Do you ever feel overwhelmed, or do you just get on with it? I, I don't think I, I don't think I ever felt overwhelmed. I, I certainly felt under pressure at times, and I certainly worried a great deal about the way the situation was deteriorating. I suppose there are two sides to it. One is that I, I, I think in general I am fairly quick in my feet. Uh, I. I uh, I think I can generally respond fairly well. And I always try to make it a principle in uh, interviews with journalists, for example, that I would genuinely try to answer the question. Um, now, you, of course, you're also trying to get a message across and you have in your mind that yours your message. But I, I tried never to fall into the old Q&A of, of, of journalists and politicians where the journalist asks the question and the, and the politician says, well, that's a very important question, but before I answer that, can I just say, and of course you never get back to answering the journalist's question. I, I don't like that. I, I like to try to answer the question. And at the same time, of course, I want to get my, my message across. But, but I, 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 I try to answer the question and, 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 and I try to respond reasonably quickly. As I said uh, earlier on, you know, those arguments and debates with my father and indeed the debating society in, in Ballerina Academy. I, and, and I ran that debating society uh, with a, a chap called Edgar Graham, who was a year older than me at school. And of course, Edgar became a, a unionist assembly member and was, and was murdered by paramilitary. So that was the context in which we were operating. But the other thing was, I've always tried to prepare my mind for situations that might arise. I've, I've, I've always tried to think my way through it. I remember, for example, I was very much involved in the school plays uh, when, I was, uh, when I was at Bellamine Academy. And uh, when we were rehearsing, there was one particular play where I was Sweeney Todd the Barber. And of course, a, a great film was made of that uh, not very long ago. But I was Sweeney Todd, developed a really wicked kind of laugh, which, which really disturbed my mother. She thought, well, my son shouldn't be, <laughs> shouldn't be looking and sounding as wicked as all of that. And, and anyway, there's a point at which Sweeney Todd is supposed to shoot one of the other members. And the way it worked was I had a starting pistol and I would fire the starting pistol and the person I was shooting at would have a blood capsule in their hand and they would smash it up against their head like that. And of course that would smash the capsule, their hands would fall down and the blood would be pouring down from what appeared to be a wound in the forehead. Excellent. But when we came to the last couple of dress rehearsals, the gun jammed. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do if this happens in, in, uh, in the event that we're on stage? And we had three nights, it was Thursday, Friday, th Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. And I thought about this for a bit. And I thought, what am I going to do if that happens? That would be really awkward. And I thought, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, if it jams, I'll go up and I'll bash his head in with the butt of the gun. <laughs> well, first night was fine. Second night was fine. Final night. That's absolutely what happened. The gun jammed, but I already knew what to do. And I, I went up and I banged <laughs> the butt of the gun into the guy's head. I mean, not in reality too hard, but he did what he needed to do. He smashed his hand up again, the blood capsule, the blood all over the place, and he, and he was killed. And, and I speak about that because it's kind of the way that I function. On the one hand, yes, I'm fairly quick on my feet, but also... I prepare myself for what I see as the likely eventualities. And most of them don't arise. But when they do, I've got some kind of backstop position. I've thought through what I might do and how I might manage with it. So both of those are, are elements. And I think both of those are things that you need in political life because you've got to be prepared for the unpredictable. Yeah, definitely. Uh, deliberate spontaneity comes to mind. That's right. <laughs> um, or, uh, or foresight. Um, more euphemistic. Um, as we then go, if, well, if we just kind of lift up again and, and go back into what's going on in the in the, in the bigger environment now, we're now going to the, into the 90s in Northern Ireland, which becomes a defining decade, really. Uh, and thankfully, on, on the positive side of things, you're, you're leader of the Alliance Party at this crucial time. Can you set the scene for us and maybe indicate what were the key um, drivers of change? Who were the key drivers of change that made what we thought was the unthinkable uh, our reality? Well, there was a very great deal happening uh, over that period of time. Uh, but if I try to encapsulate it as best I can, I suppose the first thing was an attempt to get what were called the main constitutional parties into talk. So that was the DUP, Ulster Unionist Party, Alliance Party and SDLP. 
and the British and Irish governments engaged in the process. Uh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement had uh, made their unionists run off the pitch at one end of things, um, uh, but gradually, by, by me meeting with them, by others meeting with them, by the British government meeting with them, uh, mostly at not the Irish government at that point, because the unions just simply absolutely wouldn't meet with them. Um, but, but trying to get some set of conversations underway. And eventually we got to the point of agreeing an outline for talks and getting the talks process underway with those uh, elements. But not Sinn Féin, the IRA campaign was continuing on and, and so on and so on. And we tried having a number of, of, of sets of talks. Um, and we seemed to make a bit of progress in some ways but they always kept breaking down. And I remember very well one specific occasion when um, the four of us as leaders, uh, Ian Paisley, Jim Mullen, John Hume and myself, were in a room together in Stormont. And, and this happened from time to time. We, the situation would get into difficulties, the talks weren't working very well, and we would decide that we were going to meet away from the British government, or indeed the Irish government, um, and away from our party colleagues. And what would usually happen is I would talk to Jim Molyneux and I would say, Jim, we're really stuck here. We need to have a conversation, the four of us. Would you talk to Ian? And Jim would go and talk to Ian. He had a very good relationship with him. And I would go and talk to John and I'd say, John, I think the four of us need to get together. And we would get together. And on this occasion, we got together in this room and things had not been going very well. And John said, look, I, I need to talk to the Republicans. I need to engage with the Republicans. And I looked round and the blood just drained from Jim Molyneux's face. He just went completely white. And it wasn't, it wasn't anger. He just said, well, that's it. That's the end of it then. There's no hope. Because he had the perception, which, uh, to be honest, at that point I shared, that if John went and talked to the Republicans and engaged with that, first of all, the unions could no longer talk to John. More importantly... If John was successful and brought Sinn Féin into some kind of talks, there wouldn't be any talks because the unions couldn't possibly engage with it and probably not the British government either at that point. And so I, I saw what Jim was saying made sense. And there was a, as I say, a sort of almost emotion about it with, with him and to some extent myself. But when I went home and I thought about it that night, I thought, well, I, I think that's the case. And, you know, I, I, I'd be critical of John for that because, uh, you know, I think he's harming a process that's maybe not going very well, but w there is no alternative to this process of talking. But then I began to realize that, that there was no real hope in doing anything other than following this to, to test it to destruction, really, because once John came to a conclusion about something, he, he was like the rock of Gibraltar. You know, there was no shifting him. He, he wouldn't do that without thinking about it. And he had thought about it. He talked to people and listened and so on. But once he came to a conclusion in his mind that he would follow it through. So I knew there was no way of persuading John to stop doing it, but also that there was no way of ever getting any power sharing arrangement without John there. If there was, if there was no John, there was no power sharing. That was obviously clear. So I thought, well, we, we're going to have to test this idea to destruction. And if John is, is right, then it's a whole new pa paradigm. And if he's wrong, you know, I think he will realize that and he will come back into the process we've got. So ultimately, although, as I say, politically and, and, and personally and publicly, I was very critical of him because I believed that there was a real problem here. But nevertheless, we followed down that line. And I suppose one of the points at which this became critical then was when uh, the uh, Committee on Foreign Policy, uh, voluntary uh, Committee on Foreign Policy, American Foreign Policy in the United States, decided to invite um, the, the, the five leaders to a, a meeting at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, President uh, Clinton had taken up the issue of, of Northern Ireland because during the election campaign, which he won, of course, uh, he had given uh, a commitment to Irish Americans that he would be engaged and he would do something. In fact, he would appoint an envoy. And so despite the fact that, that his Justice Department and the State Department were advising against giving a visa to Gerry Adams to go to this meeting, he decided that he would give him a visa. Only for 48 hours, wasn't allowed to raise money and so on. And the question then for, for me was what I would do. John was obviously going to accept the invitation to go to New York. Gerry was obviously going to accept it. The chances are that neither of the unions would take anything to do with it at all. What should I do? And I knew that if I talked to my colleagues and, and consulted with them, they would advise me not to do it. I would be on a nationalist platform and it would not be good for me and it would not be good for the party. 
but I felt that actually this was an opportunity um, to say to Republicans, if you give up the violence, there is an alternative, and it is democratic politics. Um, and, and, and I thought, I, I need to take the risk. Um, and the British government was very opposed to it. When they heard that I was going, they were very strongly opposed to it. And, and that was made very clear to me for, officially. Um, but I went. And uh, I didn't go onto the platform with John and Jerry. I, I, I did my business separately from theirs. But I went and I spoke at the event and gave an alternative perspective. There was actually a by-election in my area of East Belfast. The councillor council had, uh, uh, had not continued in the council and uh, there was a by-election. And this was a really important measure. What was my activity in New York going to be regarded as uh, disastrous? Uh, or was there going to be any support for it as well? And in fact, although we didn't win the seat, uh, it wasn't an alliance seat, it, we did very well, much better than expected. And the newspapers on the unionist side said, why is it that the unionist leaders are not going out and putting a unionist perspective? And the only alternative to a nationalist and Republican perspective is this guy, John Alderdice. He's the only one out there providing an alternative view to, to America, not just Irish America, but America in general. And I think it, I think it, it really changed things. Uh, after that, the whole question of, of engagement and of course, not very long after that, the, the IRA ceasefire, and then the Loyalist ceasefire. Uh, Ken McGuinness, first of all, started going out to represent the unionist perspective in, in the United States. Then others started to follow suit. It, it seems to me, and at the time, it, it was not anything like so clear, but in retrospect, it seemed to me that that was a kind of watershed moment. The decision by, by Clinton to give the visa, uh, the acceptance of it by, by, by Adams, and, and, and then John and myself going, and then the pressures that put on unions and the pressures it put on the British government began to change the whole context. And as I say, then that was subsequently followed by the IRA ceasefire, the Loyalist ceasefire, uh, the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation in Dublin Castle, uh, and, and ultimately then the talks that included Sinn Féin. Okay, so you got a, got a series of critical decisions there, really made by individuals. Um, initially by John Hume, which sort of unfroze a situation, and, and as you say, was shocking. But also, what more, the more you reflected on it, you felt, well, it was worth, it was worth going for, because the alternative was just stasis. And then you have Clinton's decision to host this event in the Waldorf, Jerry Adams' decision to attend. He probably had less to lose in this, to be honest. And then your decision uh, to go, which you had a lot to lose if it went south. Um, and how do you, how do you explain, I mean, you, you had to make this decision. You say you didn't go to your constituents. You, you made this decision yourself. How do you explain the imagination uh, that goes into these sort of decisions? Did you just have to rest on your own analysis of the situation? Or was there anyone you talked to? Or how do you explain these decisions that, that they emerge and that they're made? I think one of the things is that my background um, as a son of the manse put me in a, a slightly isolated position in a way because um, you weren't entirely free to, to do what you wanted to do. Um, you had to take responsibility for the fact that you know, if you did things that would impact on, on my father's ministry and on how people respond to things and so on. And you might say, well, that would make you very conservative. Well, it could make you very conservative. It could make you very rebellious. And some sons of the man to go to the opposite extreme. But what it did do for me was it developed in me a sense that you, you have to make your own decisions about things. And you, you won't necessarily be one of the lads. Um, because if you, if you start to go down that road, you create all sorts of stresses and strains in the family context. And I'd gone down a road of psychiatry and psychoanalysis, which, which was not the kind of most obvious and popular approach either to psychiatry or to medicine. But, but it was this question, I need to understand, I need to struggle with things, I need to find out about these things and understand them. And that means venturing out, it means taking risks. Um, now, they weren't all risks in, in the way that the, the, the New York meeting was. 
and, and sometimes you had better cover. In fact, in the New York uh, situation, Clinton didn't, didn't actually chair it. All that he did was, was allow a visa to be granted. So you didn't even have the cover of saying, well, I, you know, I've been invited by the President of the United States. Later, he invited us to things at the White House and so on. But at that stage, there wasn't much cover, really. Um, so it was risky. But what was the alternative? Uh, I, that was the thing. Did I talk to folk? I talked to, I talked to one or two people but really very few, because <laughs> there's an old principle in politics, particularly in referendums, don't ask a question unless you're prepared to hear the answer. Yeah. So if you think that the answer is not going to be the one you want, then don't ask the question, because you're only going to create more of a problem whenever you get the answer and say, well, that's, that, I don't want that answer. So I, I kind of thought I knew what the answer was likely to be uh, from, from most people. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's something to do with with your personality, the, how you grow up, the experiences that you have. Um, and, and you do a few things like that. And if enough of them come good, then it encourages you to, to continue to be, in that sense, a little bit independent minded. But you can't, be, you can't take it too far or you simply lose people. Mm. That was, you know, again, that was something I learned from my father, that he, he could, for example, example, in his sermons, find a way of, of challenging his people, but not taking it too far. You know, for example, he was a very conservative, even quite fundamentalist congregation. And he would say to them, you know, how many people who say that their Protestants are coming to their church on a Sunday? But look at the chapel. The Catholics are going to their chapel. They don't now, but in those days they did. The Catholics are going to, aren't there things we can learn like that from Catholics? Well, it was very difficult for them to say no, on the other hand, the whole idea of learning anything from Catholics was a really difficult one for them. But he would find a way of getting the challenge across to people in a fashion that didn't alienate them, that did make them ask questions, and did, did push them a little bit to, to go beyond their comfort zone. And I suppose I observed that. I was sometimes even impatient with him that he didn't go further. Um, but I, in retrospect, I, I, I think I learned a great deal more from him than I really realized at the time, which is not unusual for sons and fathers and indeed sons and mothers. Hmm. It, it's, because it, it looked like it was going to take something radical yeah. to break the deadlock, even on the back of the Good Friday Agreement. It wasn't really breaking the deadlock. And I'm reminded of something that Seamus Heaney said about, you know, walking on air against your better judgment. It required... A leap into, of faith, really, a leap of the imagination, because ordinary politics wasn't going to wasn't going to break the deadlock. Um, is that a phrase? I think he mentioned that was that something you related to. Did it feel like, that? Um, or did it feel more much more deliberate? No, I think I, I think there were various times where you just had to step out into the air. I mean, in general terms. I, I operate on a kind of stepping stone basis. That's to say, I, I, I step on the next stone, but I haven't taken my foot off the previous one yet. And I test out that stepping stone and I see how it will go. And, and in the normal run of things, that's, that's how I work. But you come to certain key points where you can't do that. You can't be certain that the, that the next stepping stone will bear your weight. But you know that simply staying on the previous stone is not going to take you forward. And you do have to take a risk. And I remember, one, I mean, one of those risks was, was after the agreement and, and the referendum um, and the assembly was elected. And the question for me then was, what am I going to do? I've been the leader of the Alliance Party for 11 years. We had got a, an agreement. Um, was I going to stay on? And I thought, you know, I don't have any heart or stomach for this um, because... I've been around that track. We don't have enough votes for me to get into the executive. Um, we, we, we had a tolerable electoral result, but it, it didn't get us enough votes under the DeHaunt system to, to get into the executive. So, you know, what am I going to do? And I decided I was going to uh, resign as leader. Um, and I remember I, I got a phone call from Tony Blair and uh, he said, uh, uh, now, John, we want you in the new executive. I said, well, that's very kind, but you can't put me in the new executive because that depends on votes and we don't have enough votes uh, to get into it under the DeHaunt system. And uh, he said, well, we need you to be the speaker then. I said, well, you know, that's up to you and the Secretary of State. It's not up to me because what happened was the initial presiding officer, 
uh, could be appointed, in fact, was appointed by the Secretary of State. But they might only be in place for, for 10 minutes just to conduct the, the election of, the, of whoever was going to be the new presiding officer or speaker elected by the Assembly. And I say, well, it's fine, you can do that if you like. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm perfectly happy to do that. I've already decided that I'm going to step down as, as leader and I have no objection to doing that. And so that's what happened. And uh, in fact, of course, it wasn't terribly surprising that the assembly couldn't reach agreement on an alternative uh, person to myself or indeed an alternative person. And so I continued on then uh, initially as initial presiding officer and then substantively as a speaker for a number of years not because I was voted in, but because they couldn't agree on an alternative person. But it gave me an opportunity then to, to fashion a, a new assembly using the kind of psychological and systemic understandings of things that I'd developed, both from my professional background and from my engagement and involvement in politics. And that became a worthwhile thing to do. But it, it only happened because I had decided that I was going to take this step out, if you like, not onto a stepping stone, but onto a Seamus Heaney cloud, <laughs> which might or might not bear any weight. But you come to points where, well, I mean, what else are you going to do? If you, if, if you know you're not going to continue with what you're doing and something needs to change, then you've got to take that risk. Well, I felt that anyway. Hmm. Um, and that sort of brings up another point that I, I you know, it, I didn't predict it at the time, that, that, that the, moderating, the moderate parties would have been the casualty of the peace process. Um, and maybe you saw that before. Maybe that was a factor, you know, John Molyneux's reaction that maybe he saw that, that even if this took off, if this took off, that the extreme parties might take over in a, in a, in a new peace scenario. Was that something that was unexpected? Um, and or, or the people kind of think this might happen? Well, it, it, it's an interesting question. I don't, I don't, entirely know all that was in Jim Olmo's mind at the time that he made that decision, which was, which was long prior to any, any talks process. But I, I know for myself that I could see problems developing in the last few weeks before the agreement. And the problem was basically this. John Hume's approach was uh, one a little bit based on the South African notion of sufficient consensus which in, you know, we in general believed in, but, but his view was that it, it should be then a majority within the nationalist community and a majority within the unionist community. And that was really what was important. And you know, anybody else didn't, didn't really count much. Um, and that was the key thing. And I think the second thing was that, that he believed that because the SDLP was the largest force within nationalism and the Ulster Unionist Party was the largest force within unionism, that if there was an agreement, the momentum of that would carry things forward and it would always be a question of the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP doing deals with each other. I didn't think that was a good idea at all because it seemed to me that that was just super prod versus super tag. And what I proposed in the weeks uh, running up to, to the agreement was that whoever wanted to be in the executive would have to be able to carry two thirds, 67% of the of the uh, representatives in the assembly. So not you know, 50% plus one of unions and 50% plus one of nations and 50% plus one of the whole, but 67% of the whole. And, and the reason for that was you could not have a government of 67% without having a substantial proportion of the other side. You couldn't have simply unionist or simply nationalist. But if you were gonna have 67% support, you needed to be able to reach across to the other side prior to any kind of elections and appointments and so on, in order to, and you'll be bringing the community together. So my view was that if you had that mechanism, which was not without its difficulties, what happened if you got 65%, but you couldn't get 67? You know, I mean, it's not without its difficulties, but nevertheless, the dynamic would be to bring people to the broad center rather than to polarize them into pillars. Well, John wasn't interested in that. He, he didn't believe in that at all. And, uh, and, and David Trimble, um, who in other circumstances might have been persuadable, but, but he, he felt that the key thing was to get an agreement with the SDLP, which is a, you know, not, not unreasonable posture to take. But the problem was when you went with that, rather than what I was proposing, then you got the outcome that you described. Because in the end, 
the SDLP could not outgreen the Shinners, and and the Ulster Unionists could not out Orange Paisley and his colleagues. And so what happened was you got this polarization, and it's not unusual. I mean, in South Africa, for example, uh, whenever uh, you got an agreement, the, the liberals in South Africa did not benefit from the agreement, certainly in the short term. Why? Because I think when you get an agreement, there's a degree of anxiety around on everybody's part. And they say, well, we're going into this, but we need to defend ourselves still against those other guys. You know, we still don't love them. We still don't trust them. So we, we need to put up our strongest champions on our side uh, to, to protect us against being overhauled by the other side. So actually, for a period of time after agreements, instead of getting people coming to the center, you get people polarizing more. And that's, that's what happened, not just with us, but it happens in other situations as well. And people think that's counterintuitive, but maybe it's not so counterintuitive if you think about the dynamics. Hmm. It's, it kind of brings up a, an interesting uh, tension sometimes between short-term political goals and longer term expectations, if you like, uh, because that obviously did change the, um, the climate, really, and, and the future. Uh, when we look now at how, you know, the Good Friday Agreement has progressed, thankfully, there has been mainly peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, so you could say it was worth the price of, of, of that. Any, anything was worth the price of that. At the other, at the other extreme, you could say, well, the extreme, but in the other sense, you could say, but it hasn't really progressed that much in the last 20 years. We've had a lot of ups and downs, fluctuations in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, and you could say that that's, that's a function of the fact that the two extremes took over and have less to talk about or less to agree upon than the moderates might have had or would have had. Um, so how do you now today look at um, politics in Northern Ireland? How are you optimistic or are you pessimistic or where are you on that? I'm relatively optimistic but but I probably need to explain why. I, I mean I think that there were a couple of things about the agreement which were serious mistakes and uh, created obstacles for us that may not have been necessary. Uh, one was this way of forming the executive that I've described, the kind of two pillars of unionists and nationalists. And the other was the business of the decommissioning of weapons. In my view, it should have been linked with the release of prisoners. So that you say, yes, the prisoners can get out, but they can only get out when their organizations have got rid of the weapons so that there's no threat and danger. And you know, I had arguments with Blair and his colleagues about that, but he took the view, I'm not sure that he was right, but anyway, he took the view that he, that was not deliverable with Sinn Féin and that therefore we needed to go the direction that he went in. And that created all sorts of problems, which you probably remember of the decommissioning of weapons and all sorts of problems that arose. But the agreement was at least robust enough to hold things together. It wasn't robust enough to deliver everything within it. And one of the reasons that, that um, the Independent Monitoring Commission was established on which I served subsequently was because the, the unionists in particular did not trust that the IRA would give up their weapons and the IRA didn't feel any pressure to give up their weapons. And so the, the agreement was powerful, but it did not have within itself all the instruments that were necessary for its own implementation. So things went much more slowly than, um, than one would have wished or, or even expected, but they did hold together and whatever else was happening, people were not being killed and injured and, 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 and their property damaged and all sorts of horrible things happened. That was not happening. We were gradually moving into a better place. And when things needed additional instruments like the Independent Monitoring Commission, that could be established and, and things could progress. But of course, the politics itself, the situation politically does not stay stable over 20 or 30 years. Other things happen externally that you may or may not have predicted. And one of the important things that's happening at the moment that was not predicted was Brexit. Mm. There was no expectation of Brexit. In fact, the whole context for agreement was based on the fact that the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland were in the European Union together, and therefore the border was not so important, and all sorts of positive things could come from that. But when you get the people of England and Wales, not of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but ne nevertheless of the UK as a whole, deciding they're going to leave the European Union, then this is a completely different thing. Now, some people look at it and they say, well, goodness, this threatens the, the agreement and we're going to go back to violence and so on and so forth. I don't think that's going to be the case at all because other things have changed during that period of time. Uh, and one of the things that has changed is the attitude of people within Northern Ireland to the question of a united Ireland. 
it has begun to change. People look at it and they, instead of saying, well, you know, here's a, a state that's socially unsympathetic to a liberal perspective, that's not doing well in, 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 in wider terms, that's inward looking, a whole bunch of things like that. Well, that's all history. That's, that's the past. That's not the, that's not the Ireland of, of the present and the future. And everybody knows that, whether they're in the Protestant community or not. They, they know that that's the case. The attitude in England has changed. There is no real sympathy for or empathy with Northern Unionism uh, within Britain. And you saw that in the decision of the, of the ERG, the European Re Reform Group, which is the, the kind of right-wing conservatives. When it came to the bit, they were prepared to sign up for the, for the Northern Ireland Protocol, every single one of them, when the DUP had assumed that they could count on them to support the Protestant Unionist position, the old playing of the orange card uh, that, uh, that Randolph Churchill had talked about way back in the, uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. And that's, that's gone now, that's disappeared. So actually, I think the dynamic now is moving more towards a united Ireland. Um, uh, which, which may be more problematic for, for some people in the Republic than they imagine. Um, uh, but, but I think that's the dynamic. And I think that the last thing that Republicans need to do now is to introduce violence to the issue, because that's the one thing that would stop moves, not just stop unionists, but stop people in the Republic of Ireland wanting to engage with the North. But if the violence doesn't recur in any substantial way, I think the dynamic of history is towards the resolution of the problem within the context of a united Ireland that relates with Britain, rather than what could have happened if unionists had been more thoughtful and strategic at an earlier stage, uh, which would have been to the, the DUP vote against Brexit and, and the UK stays within the European Union and, and Northern Ireland stays within the United Kingdom. But that extraordinary decision by them, that very unstrategic decision by, by, by the DUP, not the Ulster Unionists, but by DUP, has had huge consequences for the whole of the UK and potentially for Europe, but particularly for Ireland and its future. And it's not the one that they wanted, but it is the way that history will judge they voted. Mm. In fact, the, the picture you're drawing there is it looks like United Ireland looks more likely yeah. and a disunited kingdom is looking increasingly likely in a Brexit scenario, yes. um, where you could see, you know, Scotland breaking away as well, Wales unknown, and uh, England left to itself. Um, we have yet to see how this pans out. But I mean, how do you, as a Democrat and a Liberal Democrat, how have you? What what's what are your observations about how politics have gone in Westminster? Mainly, in the, I know you're, you're, a, you're a lord now in the House of Lords, but when you look at the House of Commons in the last three or four years, what, what, what's your view of that? Well, there, there are dynamics that are inescapable uh, right across uh, Westminster, across politics in, in, in these islands, across the world, in fact. There are dynamics that are inescapable. I used to find it a great, to be honest, a great relief to go over to the House of Lords and you would have all sorts of political disagreements, but it were all conducted in a very courteous kind of way. But in the last few years, since the Brexit uh, question came on the agenda, uh, things have become increasingly polarised, even in the House of Lords. And of course, very notably so in, in the House of Commons and in the country as a whole. Um, and, and I think that's a measure of the divisions that have been opening up for a whole series of reasons, not just our local politics, but much more widely than that. There is a fragmentation of politics globally. There is a polarization. I used to go backwards and forwards a lot to the United States. I have never seen it so polarized as it has been over the last few years. Extraordinarily so. But it's not the only country. Almost every country in Europe is either polarized or populist. Um, some, some are polarised, uh, France, for example. Um, some are just populist, like Poland and, and Hungary, although Poland actually is, is, is deeply divided, albeit that it's a populist government that has yet again been elected there. So there's, there are big things happening, and I think they're happening because of major changes. Uh, uh, the, the development of disruptive technologies, the development of disruptive technology 500 years ago with, with printing, uh, resulted in the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and, and huge political changes. We have disruptive technologies now to the power of 20 in comparison with, with printing. The sense uh, that elites are corrupt, that the, the populace cannot look up to them, cannot depend upon them for truth, for managing the economy, 
for understanding these scientific and technological developments. And so people don't trust to them because they're corrupt, but they don't trust to them to really understand what is happening either. And so we're in a, a place, I think, of enormous change. And when people are frightened, what do they do? They turn back into themselves, into their own community. Uh, you know, a student goes off to university, they have a difficult time, what do they do? They go back home again and they try to re recover themselves and then move mm. out. Uh, a patient falls ill, they, they go home, they, they, they stay into themselves. And once they recover, they move out. And so this dynamic of, of people turning to their own community, their own country, their own culture, their own background, their own religion, and following it in a somewhat fundamentalist black and white kind of way is the sort of dynamic that you see, that you expect to see. And of course, the pandemic simply adds to that kind of dynamic. It doesn't create it, but it accelerates it and adds to it. And I think that's what we're seeing. And you see it in, in the UK, as you say, it could be that this would lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. Uh, we can't be sure about that. One of the things that complexity science teaches us is you cannot predict the future however much you would like to, uh, but you can see what the possibilities and the risks are. And the way it's handled matters. Um, how Boris Johnson is handling things at the moment is absolutely heading towards the breakup of the United Kingdom. Mm. Is it inevitable that will happen? No, because it's not inevitable that he will even stay as prime minister or that he will stay on the same trajectory. But at the moment, Nicola Sturgeon is, is doing extremely well, seems to be managing things well and managing her community and her relationship with them well and, and, and could well be able to take Scotland towards independence. Were that to happen, it begs very big questions for Northern Unionists because their loyalty is not to England. Sometimes people in Ireland don't understand that. There is no sense of loyalty to England. The loyalty is in that sense to the Scottish crown <laughs> more than the English crown, but of course the same person wears that. But, but if, if Scotland with its culture and religion of Presbyterianism and all of those things, if that was to leave the United Kingdom, I think there's a massive identity crisis for, for Ulster Unionists because their identity is with, with Scotland. It's, it's not particularly with England. And so although people think, well, you know, if Northern Ireland was to go, what would happen with Scotland? It's really almost the other way round. Um, but of course, if both were to leave, then it does beg serious questions about, about how things last. Wales is a, is a bit different from the other two, um, but nevertheless, it, it begs major questions about the future. And it's not just the UK. The situation in, in Belgium, will it hold together? The position for Catalonia within Spain and indeed other parts of Spain, the Basque country and so on. It, Italy is becoming increasingly divided between North and South. Uh, so the whole of Europe is experiencing this, although the, 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 the heads of the European want, Union want to, to tell us that it's all holding together except for for Britain, that it's much more shaky and uncertain than that. And it's a global phenomenon, this fragmentation, and it is potentially dangerous. Mm. Well, one of the um, one of the things that's probably most striking about the, the way the trends are going is that we're seeing the, you know, the, the potentially the eclipse of the liberal democratic consensus in the Western world. It's, it's probably still too early to tell, but at the very least we can say we're reaching an inflection point and it could go a number of ways, in ways that we probably couldn't have imagined even five years ago. Um, there were people, obviously, who always predicted that th things were very fragile, but, you know, we, we felt that there was enough robust there to keep it going. But when you look at beyond that, so let's say you're not even a liberal, you're not a Democrat, I think the more fundamental challenge, and, so, and a word you've used there is, is truth, right? If truth becomes something that's disposable, politics things get really very very tricky and dangerous and we're seeing truth more and more push the sidelines most obviously obviously in america with the idea of alternative facts uh, but also in those countries you're mentioning you don't have to go to america to find truth being uh, suppressed or, or marginalized um and I'm just thinking one of the lessons of, of the northern ireland peace process was that the truth was, was always out there. Um, so how, how concerned are you, or do you see truth being critical to political success or political stability and peace? Um, and do you see that kind of same marginalization of truth going? It is a very important issue. There's no doubt about that. But you know, in the end, <clears throat> 
facts will actually come out. And they'll come out because everything isn't dependent on humanity's judgment. The virus is not sitting there thinking, am I annoying Donald Trump? Or what does President Xi think about this? The virus does what the virus does. The climate situation will develop. Uh, and if people don't pay attention to it, that doesn't mean it will go away. Um, so you can, the facts in the end will out. It, it may take some time, but we had this experience in Northern Ireland, you know. After the agreement, when the issue of the weapons had not been fully sorted out, but the British and Irish governments, maybe especially the British government, was dreadfully keen to hold the agreement together and make sure we didn't go back to, to war again. But the paramilitary organizations, while they weren't shooting at each other, they were using their weapons to control their own people and, and doing some horrible things, which they described as punishment beatings but they, and, and shootings. But they were just abusive people. And horrible things were done to their own people. And, and this left each side, particularly the, the union side, very worried that, that the, uh, the IRA hadn't got rid of their weapons and they could take them out and use them for the previous purpose again. The problem was that the British government didn't want to acknowledge the reality of that. And when you started having increasingly uh, aggressive things being done, quite clearly by the IRA, Mo Molam, who's the British Secretary of State at that time, would be asked, well, you know, is this a breach of the ceasefire? And she started using terms like, well, the ceasefire is intact in the round, mm -hmm. which was a piece of meaningless nonsense you know it's a bit like saying this person's almost a virgin you know you kind of you are you aren't in many ways but what people saw when they heard that was that the government was not being truthful the government knew things it knew who was doing stuff and it was not prepared to come out and say that this is what's happening and so the whole process of the agreement almost unstitched completely but the two governments realized there was a problem the americans realized there's a problem and they decided to establish an independent body, the Independent Monitoring Commission, with somebody from America, the former head of the CIA, Dick Kerr, the former head of justice in the Republic of, of Ireland, Joe Brosnan, former head of the Metropolitan Police Anti-Terrorist Branch, John Greve, so he knew about what he was talking about, and myself from Northern Ireland, as if you like, the kind of the political dimension to things. And uh, we were asked to tell it like it was, Follow the evidence, make reports, make reports on security, but make reports on paramilitary organizations, their links with, with politicians. Tell us the truth about what's actually happening with, with these people. And so we started to do that. And initially people thought, oh, well, you know, it's just going to be a, a kind of a yes minister for, for the government, whatever the government wants. It's not really independent. But we did feel that the truth was important, that we were prepared to follow the evidence, and in some cases the money, to find out what was really going on. And we were prepared to say it and publish it. And if the governments liked it, that was fine. The governments didn't like it, that was also fine. Um, that wasn't the important. We were asked to be independent. Well, don't ask for something you don't want. We're gonna be independent, we're gonna say it. And gradually it became apparent to the paramilitaries and to the community in general, that if they read our reports, they would almost always find out what actually was the truth about what was going on. And that was crucial. The, the, the whole thing would have gone to pieces if it hadn't been for that process, because the truth in the end is actually important. In the short term, you can get away with, 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 with spin. But in the long term, the facts will out. And the facts will out about the bigger politics, but they also, in the end, they will out in local politics. So if you have the medium to long term outlook, not the what's the result of the next election outlook, then I think the thing that you point up about facts is absolutely important, but it will actually happen. And either as humanity, we will accommodate ourselves to the facts or we will not survive. Mm. And that, that, that's kind of an important, I think, leads us to, a, I think, a question that's kind of important as well. You know, an awful lot, there's an awful lot of cynicism about politics. Um, it's always been there, but it's probably more widespread now. You know, I'm not voting. They're all they're all a shower of you know corrupt. They're all just feathering their own nest. I mean, what do you say to that fairly common view? Well, I I, I say to them, I suppose two things. First is um, that there is a degree of truth 
to their concern and their cynicism. But the only reason those politicians are there is because they have been voted in. And if they are voted in, that means that they represent something of where the community is at. And we need to understand that. Now, what they represent, given the polarization that there is in politics, is a deeply divided community in which neither side is really taking seriously what the other side is saying, and even more important, what the other side is feeling. And so the reason that somebody like Donald Trump is elected is not because a whole raft of people believe the things that Donald Trump says. Very few people believe them. Even Donald Trump doesn't believe the things he says. But in his very personality, this angry, truculent, resentful, brushing aside of reality and so on and so forth, he represents how a lot of people in America feel. They feel angry, frustrated, set aside, disregarded, frightened about, about what the future holds. And so this guy represents how they feel about things, even if they don't believe him or agree with everything that he says. So it's very important to understand that and then to take that seriously. Now, you said earlier on a, a, a tipping point or a, or, or, or a watershed for the whole question of liberal democracy. And I think that's right. And is that a cause for being frightened? Well, yes. But, you know, every form of governance, every way of looking after and running ourselves as society has had a shelf life. Things have changed. And although people like Fukuyama thought that liberal democracy was the kind of end point of human mm. cultural development, it clearly wasn't and isn't. We don't know what the next stage is. And, and for those of us that think about these things, the challenge is not to wring our hands and say how terrible everything is, but rather to say, what is the next step? It, it may be a stepping stone. It may be that we can put our feet on a new way of thinking about things that we can be confident in. In that sense, the reformers, for example, believed, and were very clear, that the decisions and the understandings of things should not be made by bishops and princes. They should be made by ordinary people with access to the Bible, to read it for themselves, make their own decisions and democratic votes and so on and so on. And so the church structures changed, eventually the political structures changed, and we've taken the last few hundred years of working out what democracy means, given that kind of understanding of it, and, and inclusive democracy in that everybody has the chance to vote, not just a few men with money. Uh, but, but maybe we've come to the point where that way of doing things is no longer sufficient, convincing, persuasive to people, that we actually have to move on. But it may not be that we have the clarity that the reformers had, that here is what we have to move on to. We may be much more like Seamus Heaney, stepping out with a degree of uncertainty as to where we're going. But that doesn't mean abandon thinking about things, abandon hope. In, on the contrary, it means we have to, to use every arrow in our therapeutic quiver to try to, to get to the next point, the next stage. And that's a challenge and it's risky and it might not work, but, but I still retain that sort of optimism in a sense. Not that I know what the future holds, but that there are ways of addressing these things that can bring us to a new future, not without some cost. I often used to say at home that people need to understand that the, the, the prize of peace involves a price for peace, that there are things you have to give up and let go of if there's gonna be new sets of relationships. Is it worth it? Well, of course, I believed it would be worth it. Um, but, but I didn't know how it was going to work out, and nobody knows how it's going to work out. But it's a challenge, and it's an opportunity. And I retain that degree of optimism that as a race we can survive, albeit in a different way than the way we've survived since the last conflagration, which was, of course, the Second World War. Mm. Well, on that a realistic, but I also think hopeful note, uh, I think we'll, we'll bring this um, conversation to a close, John. Um, but before we do, I, I would like to ask you, I ask all my uh, interlocutors, um, I imagine they're on a desert island, this kind of pop, uh, book, um, piece of music and luxury that they might bring along with them. So uh, could you indicate what you'd bring with you on a, on a desert island? On a desert island, rather? 
Well, first of all, the book. And there was a book called The Changing Vesture of the Faith that was written by a, a Presbyterian son of the manse and a theologian in the uh, early part of the, the last century. And, and what he meant by this and what he meant by the book was that there are things that are fundamental to us. Life is fundamental, but you can't package it up. Faith of venturing out into the future is fundamental, but it, how it works its way out is different in every generation. Whether you're talking about church or politics or knowledge or science or any of these things, it changes. But there's, there's something of the essence of humanity in there that is clothed in a different way, the changing vesture of the faith. I read the book nearly every year. And so if I had to take it, and I assume that I'm um, allowed the Bible and the works of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. as, as one usually is on these desert island things, that's the, that's the book I would take. The piece of music I would take, well, if I wasn't going to be there for too long, if, if I wasn't going to be in the desert island for too long, I'd take um, Eric Clapton Unplugged. Uh, I, I love his music and, and I love the, uh, more the, the acoustic guitar. But if I'm going to be there for a long time, then I would take uh, a record or disc or whatever way I could play the music of the brothers at the Teze community in France who have taken the old extraordinary Benedictine way of worship and chant and have taken it into a new and modern theme which is for me extraordinary and indeed for thousands of young people who visit there and stay there every year it continues to be inspirational so if we're going to be there for a long time I'll take that kind of inspiration with me and for a luxury, one of the things about the lockdown is that it's enabled us to do things that we always wanted to do, but didn't have the time as we thought. And if I was on a desert island, I think I'd have the time to get back to playing the guitar again. And my luxury would be to take my acoustic guitar with me and have the time to spend getting back to the way it was when I was in my teens and 20s and uh, could amuse myself by playing and, and, and singing. Very good. And we, we'll then listen to John Alderweireld unplugged when you when you eventually come back. <laughs> Hopefully, amazing. Um, John, I, I've been really looking forward to talking to you, and and you certainly didn't let let me down on what you said. You were full of insight uh, and hope and inspiration, and yet uh, deep realism. Um, I've followed your career for pretty much all my life with a lot of admiration, and I know that you're. Your, in, your insightfulness has really come from, you know, being in the cold face of politics and showing that uh, really great things can happen out of what looks like a very bleak and irredeemably bad situation. So I want to congratulate you again on, on everything you've achieved and to thank you for taking part in my series. It's been a real privilege and honour to have you as a guest. Well, thank you very much indeed, Johnny. And, you know, you yourself are are and have been playing, a, a, in, in my view, an important role. I found your book on Isaiah Berlin an inspiring book. It, it, it enabled me, and I've recommended it to many other people, because it takes up these essentially liberal ideas and puts them in the context of history, but that enables us to take them forward into the future. Because whatever the future holds, I do still hope and want to work to it being a liberal future. Great. Well, thank you very much, John. It's very kind. And... Uh, I wish you all the best uh, with the future much. in your private and public life. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.